Welcome to Wednesday. Um, today <clears throat> we're doing poetry and I have selected one book that we're going to take a look at uh, which is uh, Joy 100 Poems edited by Christian Women. Wonderful cover. If you notice all this sort of quasi rainbow on the side and one of the interesting things is the rainbow is included in the graphics on the title page you've got a black and white version and it ambles through the book now i'm going to read you some bits from the introduction because it's particularly uh, relevant i mean the title might be a toss-off joy so okay all these poems are about joy it's about a lot more than joy it's about using poetry to take us to the places where joy exists and not and remind us not to forget that joy in addition to all the other things is still there i didn't look at the black back fly leaf until the last i didn't know christian women i could have told you after reading the introduction that i probably intuited this correctly he is a professor of the practice of religion and literature at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. You'll see this thread weaves its way through. Introduction is called Still Wilderness. <clears throat> Paul Tillich once said of the word faith that it belongs to those terms which need healing before they can be used for the healing of men. The word joy may not be quite so one wounded, uh, though I have noticed, uh, as I have mentioned this project to people over the past year, that it does provoke some conflicting responses. There is the back slacking, slapping bon ami of the evangelically joyful who smile, as if to say, Oh, even you, old sludge, dire poet of our party at last. There is academic detachment. Is joy merely an intensification of happiness or an altogether other order of experience? And is it something of which one can be conscious at all? Or if it is so difficult, by immersion in a present tense that consciousness, as we conceive it, is precluded. There is a front. Ruined migrants, my, uh, migrants spilling over borders, rabid politicians frothing for power, terrorists detonating their own insides like terrible literal metaphors for an entire time gone wrong. How with this rage shall beauty hold a theme? As Shakespeare, staring down his own age's accelerating grimace, wondered. I took on this project because I realized that I was somewhat confused about the word myself. And I have found that for me, the best way of thinking through any existential problem is with poetry, which does not think through such a problem so much as undergo it. Subjected to poetry's extremities of form and feeling, what might that one word in these wild me. This is wondrous and small. Sarah Lindsay writes the poem, Small Moth. <laughs> She's slicing ripe peaches into the Tony the Tiger bowl and dropping slivers for the, uh, the dog poised, vibrating by her foot to stop their fall. And she spots it, camouflaged, a 
glimmer, and then full-on happiness, plashing blunt, soft wings inside her, as if it wants to escape again. And then there is William Wordsworth, our uh, great English poet of joy, and I'm going to read a very brief bit from a poem of his, Tintern Abbey. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me, as is a landscape, to a blind man's eye. But oft, in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them, in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood, and felt among along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Feelings of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on the best portion of a good man's life. His little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love nor less, I trust, to them I, I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime than blessed moon, in which the burthen of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the uh, affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and, and even the, the motion of our human blood almost suspended. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy. We see into the life of things. <laughs> and this Donald Hall wrote. In June's high light, she stood at the sink with a glass of wine and listened for the bobolink and crushed garlic in late sunshine. I watched her cooking from my chair. She pressed her lips together, reached for kitchenware and tasted sauce from her fingertips. It's Ready now. Come on, she said. You, li light the candle. We ate and talked and went to bed and slept. It was a miracle. Tell me ordinary life cannot. I hope, he continues in his introduction, it's apparent by this point that poetry itself, the making of it, certainly, but also the remaking of it as the reader, is often a form of joy. Indeed, C.S. Lewis' famous memoir, Surprised by Joy, an early encounter with poetry is one of three experiences of disabling, enabling joy to which he uh, attributes his eventual conversion. Lewis describes a seismic shock, the kind that happens only a handful of times in one's life. Certainly there are lesser joys which are still clearly distinguishable from mere 
Further, he says, joy, that durable, inexhaustible, essential, and adequate word. That something in the soul that makes one able to claim again the word soul. That sensation more exalting than happiness, less graspable than hope, though both of these feelings are implicated. And in conclusion of the introduction, in addition to the 100 poems, I've included a number of quotations from other texts. Most of these are from the prose of poets, but some are from works of theology, philosophy, natural science, and correspondence. These are intended to inflect individual poems or groups of poems in different ways. Some of the questions contradict each other and or points I have made in my introduction, which seems inevitable and necessary for any book that is meant to be an argument but an experience. And now, into a taste of some of the hundred poems. Now, you know, I wouldn't let this one go by without reading it. It's from Robert Frost. Directive. Back out of all this now too much for us. Back in a time made simple by the loss of detail, burned, dissolved, and broken off like graveyard marble sculpture in the weather, there is a house that is no more a house, upon a farm that is no more a farm, and in a town that is no more a town. The road there, if you'll let a guide direct you who only has at heart your getting lost, may seem as if it should have been a quarry. Great monolithic knees the former town long since gave up pretense of keeping covered. And there's a story in a book about it. Besides the wear of iron wagon wheels, the ledges show lines rules southeast, northwest, the chiseled work of an enormous glacier that braced his feet against the Arctic Pole. You must not mind a certain coolness from him still said to haunt the side panther mountain, nor need you mind the serial ordeal of being watched from forty cellar holes as if by eye pairs out of forty firkins. As for the wood's excitement over you that sends light rustle rustles in their leaves, charge that to upstart inexperience. Where were they all, not 20 years ago? They think too much of having shaded out a few old pecker-fretted apple trees. Make yourself up a cheering song of how someone's rode home from work this once was, who may be just ahead of you on foot, or creaking with a, a buggy load of grain. The adventure is the height of country where two village cultures faded into each other. Both of them are lost. And if you're lost enough to find yourself by now, pull in your ladder road behind you. Oh, and put up a sign, closed to all but me. Then make yourself at home. 
The only field now left no bigger than a harvest ball. First, there's the children's house of make-believe. Some shattered dishes underneath a pie. The playthings in the playhouse of the children. Weep for what little things could make them glad. Then for the house that is no more a house, but only a belilacked cellar hole. Now, slow, slowly closing like a dent in dough. This was no playhouse, but a house in earnest. Your destination and your destinies, a brook that was the water of the house, cold as a spring, as yet so near its source, too lofty and original to rage. We know the valley streams that, when aroused, will leave their tatters hung on barb and thorn. And I have kept hidden in the instep arch of an old cedar at the waterside a broken goblet like the grave under a spell so the wrong ones can't find it, so can't get saved. As St. Mark says, they mustn't. <laughs> I stole the goblet from the children's playhouse. Here are your waters and your watering place. Drink and be whole again, beyond confusion. And from Sir Teasdale, oh, I have what we've all been looking for. The answer. When I go back to earth and all my joyous body puts off the red and white that once had been so proud, if men should pass above with false and feeble pity, my dust will find a voice to answer them aloud. Be still. I am content. Take back your poor compassion. Joy was a flame in me, too steady to destroy. Lithe as a bending reed, Loving the storm that sways her. I found more joy in sorrow than you could find in joy. <laughs> From R.S. Thomas. Lore. <clears throat> Job Davies, 85 winters old and still alive after the slow poison and treachery of the seasons. Miserable, keep my horse. It needs more than the rain's hearse, wind drawn, to pull me off the great perch of my lap. What's living but courage, paunched full of hot porridge, nerves strengthened with tea, peat black, drawn, found me mowing where the grass grew, bearded with golden dew, rhythm of the long sight, kept this strong frame. Stay green. Never mind the machine whose fuel is human souls. Live large, man, and dream small. <laughs> Ooh. 
Laureen Niedecker, in Laundromat, says, casual, sudsy, social love at the tubs. After all, ecstasy can't be constant. And from Emily Dickinson, who never wanted maddest joy. Who never wanted maddest joy remains to him unknown. The banquet of abstemiousness defaces that of wine. Within its reach, though yet ungrasped, desires perfect goal, no nearer, lest the actual should disenthrall thy soul. And from one of our shared favorites, Elizabeth Bishop writes, The Moose. along with us. From narrow provinces of fish and bread and tea, home of the long tides where the bay leaves the sea twice a day and takes the herrings long rides. Where if the river enters or retreats in a wall of brown foam, depends on if it meets the bay coming in, the bay not at home, where silted red some time, the sun sets facing a red sea, and others veins the flats lavender, rich mud in burning rivulets of red gravelly roads, down rows of sugar maples, past clabbered farmhouses, and neat clabbered churches, bleached, ridged as clam shells, past twin river birches, through late afternoon, a bus journeys west, the windshield flashing pink, pink, glassing off of metal, brushing the dented flank of blue beat up enamel. Down hollows, uprises, and waits, patient, while a lone traveler gives kisses and embraces to seven relatives, and a collie supervises. Goodbye to the elms, to the farm, to the dawn, the bus starts, the light grows richer, the fog shifting, salty, thin, comes closing in, its cold round crystals form and slide and settle in the white hen's feathers. In gray glazed cabbages on the cabbage roses and lupins like apostles, the sweet peas clinging to their wet white string on the white washed fences, bumblebees creep inside the foxgloves, and evening commences. One stop. River. Then the economies, lower, middle, upper, five islands, five houses, where a woman shakes a tablecloth out after supper. A pale, flickering, gone. The Tantrama marshes and the smell of salt hay. An iron bridge trembles and a loose plank 
rattles. Oh, but does it? Give way. On the left, a red light swims through the dark. A ship's port lantern. Two rubber boots show illuminated, solemn. A dog gives one. A woman climbs in with two market bags, brisk, freckled, elderly. <gasps> the grand night. Oh, yes, sir, all, all the way to Boston. She regards us amicably. Moonlight as we enter the New Brunswick woods, hairy, scratchy, splintery. Moonlight and mist caught in them like lamb's wool on bushes at a pasture. The passengers lie back, snores, some long sighs, a dreamy divagation begins in the night, a gentle auditory slow hallucination in the creakings and noises, an old conversation, no, not concerning us, but recognizable somewhere back in the bus. Grandparents' voices uninterruptedly talking in eternity. Names being mentioned, things cleared up finally. What he said, what she said, who got pensioned, deaths, deaths and sicknesses. The year he remarried, the year something happened. Oh, she died in childbirth. Birth. That was the son lost when the schooner foundered. He took to drink, yes. She went to the bad. When Amos began to pray, even in the store, and finally the family had to have him put away. Yes, that peculiar affirmative. Yes, a sharp, indrawn breath, half groan, half acceptance, that means a life's like that. We know it. talking the way they talked in the old feather bed, peacefully, on and on, dim lamplight in the hall, down in the kitchen, the dog tucked in her shawl. Now, it's all right now even to fall asleep, just as on all those nights, suddenly, the bus driver stops with a jolt, turns off his lights. A moose has come out of the impenetrable wood and stands there, looms rather, in the middle of the road. It approaches, it sniffs at the bus's hot hood towering, antlerless, high as a church, homely as a house, or oh, safe as houses. A, a man's voice assures us, oh, you look perfectly harmless. Some of the passengers exclaim in whispers, childishly, softly, sure are oh, big creatures. It, it, it's awfully plain. Oh, look, it's a she taking her time. She looks the bus over. Grand, otherworldly. Why? Why do we feel? Oh, we, we all feel this, this sweet sensation. Curious creatures, says our quiet 
driver, rolling his R's. Look at that, would you? Then he shifts gears for a moment longer by craning backward the most can be seen for the moment, the cattle. Then there's a dim smell of moose, an acrid smell of gasoline. Even a bus journey can inspire a poem. Gwendolyn Brooks writes, The rights for Cousin Vit carried her unprotesting out the door, kicked back the bas the casket stand, but it can't hold her. That stuff and satin aiming to enfold her, the lids contrition nor the bolts before. Oh, oh, too, too, too much, too much. Even now, surmise, she rises in the sunshine. Th there she goes, back to the bars she knew and the repose in love rooms and the things in people's eyes. Too vital and too squeaking must emerge. Even now she does the snake hips with a hiss, slops the bad wine across her shan tongue, talks of pregnancy, guitars and bridge work, walks in parks or alleys, comes happily on the verge of happiness, happy step. Is and in closing, the blessings of the old woman, the tulip, and the dog, the militia Suskin Ostriker. To be blessed, said the old woman, is to live and work so. God's love washes right through you like uh, milk through a cow. To be blessed, said the dark red tulip, is to knock their eyes out with a slug of lust implied by your upended skirt. To be blessed, said the dog, is to have a pinch of God inside you. And all the other dogs can smell it. Okay, until next we meet again on Friday. Have a good rest of the week.